Welcome to Scaffold's third webinar for the year. My name is Shepard Gonera. Our first presenter for the day is Chris, who's uh, not only a co-founder of Scaffold, but he's also Scaffold's general manager. Chris, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Shepard, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. And our second presenter is none other than Peter. Peter is the founder and CEO of Main Street Financial Group. Good afternoon, Peter, and welcome. Good afternoon, Shepard. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me today. Now, it's our first time to have Peter on as our webinar. Now, Peter, do you mind just telling us the story of Main Street in about 30 seconds or so, and uh, where, where it's come from and where we're heading? Sure. Um, absolutely. Main Street um, has only been founded a few years. Uh, my personal background goes back to the early 90s, where I was a, a banking analyst with BZW, the, the investment banking arm of Barclays Bank. I covered the Australian banking sector and diversified financials. So I was one of the top rated analysts uh, amongst the bigger firms. And I basically traveled the world advising institutions on their bank sector holdings here in Australia. In 1999, I founded a company called Aegis that was Australia's largest independent equities research house. Wow, you're the man behind Aegis? I was the man behind Aegis, that's wow. right. Wow. At, um, at a high point, we had over 60 people, 27 analysts covering over 300 stocks. That's big. Um, we had over 4,500 advisors, over 22 private client stockbroking firms that we used to write research for. And we, uh, I think we added up the, through their clients' clients, we had about sort of, uh, we touched about 2 million investing Australians. Um, I sold our business in 2010 to Morningstar. Okay. Oh, wow. um, and um, I did some gardening leave for about four years and then came back <laughs> and found it, um, Main Street. And here I am today. Right, look, let's get straight into it. Uh, We've got a, almost a full house. We're still only a few more places left. Now, I want to start off with this chart. Now, what we're looking at is the annual growth of GDP in Australia. Now, believe it or not, gentlemen, it's been 25 years since our last recession in Australia. Now, there's only one other country that's reached close, that's actually beat that mark, and that's Netherlands, and that reached 26 years before it it, uh, <clears throat> it got back into recession. And we're just a doorstep from taking away that pole position. Now, having looked at that chart, the last time we were in recession, some of our attendees were actually still in diapers. Some weren't even born by that time. But uh, does that necessarily translate to the Australian economy as a whole, in terms of our businesses? Does that translate to going well globally? Peter, I want to start off with you. Let's have a look at global markets. Um, I mean, having started ages and, and having started Main Street, you obviously invest globally? I do, yes. Okay, now... What do you look out for? You know, which markets do you look at globally and, and why those markets in particular? Sure. I, I look at, at various markets for, for different reasons. I mean, the first thing that I look for in any market is a strong, healthy economy, um, you know, sustainable economic growth, um, reasonable levels of inflation and interest rates that, that helps growth. Then at a, at a company-specific level, I look for, for sustainable uh, earnings growth. I look for a unique differentiating factor that identifies that company from the crowd. And I look for sustainable, you know, earnings growth. Um, I'm a, I believe in cash flow, so mm -hmm. I look for free cash flow. I think that's very important. Um, and then depending on the companies and how they operate, whether they're internationally based in the country, operating internationally or within that country, you know, we make certain assessments from there. Okay. Now, now, do you have any examples of uh, one or two global markets that, that you find interesting? Well, I mean, at, at the moment, I particularly like the UK. I uh -huh. think that with, you know, the situation with Brexit there, that's opened up a, a pricing opportunity for, for certain investments there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like the, you know, the banking sector, believe it or not. Um, there are still issues, uh, I think, in terms of the, you know, the broader outlook for Europe uh -huh. and how that will affect uh, asset values and in turn the capital requirements of the banking sector, but by by uh, the whole they, they've been recapitalised sort of post the GFC, they're trading at significant discounts compared to their counterparts both in Australia and offshore. Okay. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, um, you know, given my, um, my origins of, um, you know, Greece, I kind of like Certain certain investments in Greece at the moment, I think, are looking very good. <laughs> Sounds um, like you're a bit of a contrarian there. I'm a, I'm a contrarian. I'm a contrarian. <laughs> That's just, so, not, are you worried about a recession in the UK following the Brexit? Uh, I am. I think that, um, unfortunately, the, the Brits built themselves a wall and then drove their economy right into it. Um, so at the moment, um, you know, given that we do have an office and we have staff uh, in the UK that look at international investments there, 
I think what we're finding at the moment is a lot of uncertainty. People mm -hmm. are too scared to make investments because they're not certain okay. in terms of the, the roadmap going forward. Um, that's having an impact on, on prices. Yep. Um, and, it, you know, it's having an, an effect on, on our, you know, where people are investing. At the moment, they're not investing. Yeah, right. um, yeah. And that creates the opportunity. So... Does it necessarily follow that if, if uh, the UK does go into a recession that the stock market therefore goes down or does that not necessarily follow hand in hand? Well, theoretically, the say the stock market is always forward looking, so it tends to look 12 to 18 months forward. So, you know, if we are sitting at the prospect of a, 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 a recession, uh, sorry, a recession um, or an economic slowdown, the, the market would have already anticipated that in its numbers um, and it, its pricing. So. I think, you know, the issue with, with me as a fundamental analyst, um, you know, looking through P&Ls and, and, and balance sheets and cash flow and all the rest of it, is identifying intrinsic value in, in some things. At the end of the day, everything has a value, everything has a price. Um, and you can't always pick the bottom and you can't always pick the top. Yeah. But uh, at least if, you, if you're disciplined in terms of the, you know, the investment arithmetic that you use, the measures that you use, um, you know, if you're disciplined and you follow a process, more often than not, you can make money. Okay. Now, Peter, really quickly, uh, you mentioned Greece, you mentioned the UK. Now, do you find any common global market themes, uh, even spreading out to other markets outside those two? Well, it's, yes, there is. There's a global theme at the moment, and that's everyone starting to pay a premium for income. Okay. okay. Um, you've got very little growth. Um, in the world at the moment. People are scared about the potential impact of the Brexit. Yeah. Uh, people are scared that Europe, um, I mean, there's only one real economic engine driving Europe at the moment, and that is Germany. Um, um, the world at the moment is in a fragile spot. We're seeing all you know elections that are being held. Um, they're going to centre-left you know, governments, and people are questioning what impact that's going to have on financial markets and stock markets. We're entering a period where we're starting to see increased regulation yeah. and business and markets in general don't like regulation. You know, they prefer free markets, and free trade and laissez-faire. Um, so the world's sort of trending towards the, the middle to left at the moment and that's causing a lot of uncertainty in people's investing and in the way that they price things. We're seeing everyone sort of fly to the US dollar. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you know, China's a you know a concern. Southeast Asia is slowing as well. It's a concern. Um, I mean, my concern is that um, I think we're getting to the position where the North American markets are looking very overvalued compared to other international markets. But the reason for that is is because there's a flight to safety. Okay. Um, and I mean, I'm surprised. I've been an equities analyst now for 27 years, and I look at the North American market and I reflect back to the. The global financial crisis that we had in 2008, 2009, uh -huh. and I see the Dow breaking record high after record high after record high, and I compare it to a country like Australia, where it's 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 we've got a you know great foundation. Our our, our companies have restructured their balance sheets, um, they've reduced debt, um, we've got good earnings prospects, and we're well. It, you know, we, we sort of bottomed at 5,000 and we're at 5,500. We're still way below the 6,000 peak that we've reached. And I look at I look at the Dow breaking through record highs and, you know, if you if you do the math over the last, what's it been, eight years, yeah. um, revenue growth hasn't been that big. Earnings growth hasn't been that big. In fact, I think we've outperformed them both on revenue and, and earnings growth over that period. Okay. Um, they're breaking through records every day and it's just, it's just a wall of money. Mm, yeah. Right, we'll fight the quality. So, all right, like Peter, I, I like that you brought up the US. I have uh, some interesting stats here to bring up. Um, now, over the last five years, the US has actually been the best performing market in terms of large cap stocks. So let's get that around. We, we've, I'm focusing on large cap stocks here. Now, I want to bring it up to the attendees, Peter. You mentioned you love the UK, and I know everyone is going to vote and say the US has done well. So look, we'll take that out of the equation. So the US has done the best. But what I want to ask everyone attending is um, when you look at the markets, now out of the following markets, which one do you guys think has performed the second best? So I'd like everyone to quickly vote. Please select the answer that you think is the um, market that has performed second best after the US and focusing on large caps.
Okay, so there are the results. Um, so obviously, like I mentioned, the US uh, has been the one. Now, second best there is Singapore. But gentlemen, I find it very interesting that uh, the ASX is actually close to being the second best performer there. Uh, the UK, Peter, looks it looks like uh, our, our 300 or something odd attendees don't quite agree with you. <laughs> but uh, look, well, I'm looking forward, not looking back. <laughs> okay, that's good. Well, look, I'll bring Chris in. Uh, Chris, look, let's let's uh, have a quick look here. And just just walk us through those market comparisons. And, okay. And what are the actual figures? Great. Thanks for that, Shepard. So what I'll do now, I'll pull up a chart which shows how the markets have gone over the last five years. Now, unfortunately, for all those of you who voted for Singapore, which was the majority, um, Singapore was the worst performing market out of all of those. You can see the pink line there. That's Singapore. The best, which was actually received the fewest votes was, second best rather, after the USA, was in <laughs> fact Switzerland. And only 12% voted for Switzerland. So congratulations to you if you're in that 12%. <laughs> you're actually right, right on the money. Switzerland has been the second best performing market. And as you can see in that chart, it's only just deviated away from the US in the last um, six months or so. So it, it really has done very well. Um, some interesting things to note, I mean, as, as Peter was discussing, the US has really been steaming ahead over the last five years. And there's a few factors uh, involved in that. One is they have had a growing economy, um, not screaming along, but growing. Interest rates are very low in, in the US, around zero. And there have been some particular businesses that have done very well, particularly some of the big tech stocks. And like Peter was saying, that wall of money where people are looking for somewhere to invest and there don't seem to be many alternatives. As you mentioned, Peter, that income play, uh, when you're getting zero or even less in some markets to put your money in fixed interest, well, you're looking for yield wherever you can find it. You know, and, and a lot of um, companies you know, are able to provide you know, a reasonable dividend. Um, Australia is the middle of the pack there, so you know not not too bad, but certainly not one of the the strongest markets. But what's interesting is the Asian market. So Singapore is the the worst performer over the last five years. You know we tend to think of Asia as being dynamic and exciting, but we have we haven't shown it. But the Hong Kong market was also the second worst um, market out of the, all the markets that you can access through Scaffold. So in the last five years, Asia has actually not been the place to be. Now, what I thought was interesting is, you know, this is put together based on local currency terms. But if you think about it as an as an Aussie, if, if you're an Aussie and you're investing in these markets, how have you gone in Australian dollar terms? So we've rebased this chart into Australian dollar terms. And you can see there the US has really screamed ahead. If you put $10,000 into the US, 10,000 Aussie dollars into the US five years ago, that would now be worth around 25,000 Australian dollars. So you've had the not just the performance of the market itself, but also the currency. The US dollar has been very strong over that period, and that has uh, really benefited you if, if you chose to uh, invest in that asset. In, in Aussie dollar terms, the UK goes from underperforming to outperforming the Australian market, only just, but nevertheless it is in front. And so with the exception of the Canadian dollar, the Aussie dollar has generally been falling over the last five years um, and that provides a boost to your returns when you're investing in offshore markets. Now Chris, just, just to be clear here, so if we switch back to the previous screen, so we're saying this is how they've performed in their local currencies. So if we put in £1,000, 500 Australian Correct. That's and, right, Shepard. And in this second screen, we're saying if we put in, if we put in, uh, let's just say, a hundred thousand Australian dollars in each of these indexes, this is how they would have performed over the years. Yeah, that's right. So this okay. is just yes, yes. just explaining to you how you would have gone as as an Australian investor, which okay. I'm kind of assuming most of our audience probably are. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight, just while we're talking about these global markets, is this table here which just gives us a breakdown of dividend yields and PE ratios as at a couple of days ago for these different markets. And a couple of things that stand out. One is, of course, the Australian market has very high dividend yield. Um, Australia is sort of notorious, if that's the right word, for paying out very high yields. 
And the other thing that stood out is, again, the Asian markets, Hong Kong and Singapore, very low PE ratios at the moment, which I guess is a reflection of the fact that they haven't really been performing all that well. I guess what's key here, Shepard, is you can see that by putting your money in different markets around the world, you're taking advantage of um, diversification. So, you know, at, at different times, different markets will do well. Okay. At different times, different currencies will do well. And by spreading your, your assets across some of those global markets, you, you get the opportunity to benefit that. What's key, of course, we're talking about the last five years, but what we all want to know is what's going to happen in the next five years. Now, none of us know that, but we, we increase our chances of capitalising on the good things by um, diversifying our portfolios into, into some of those other markets. Let's take the gloves off here. So we've talked about the, the different markets. We've seen how they've performed, whether we've uh, in local currency terms. Let's just go by, uh, obviously we invest in different stocks. Let's go stock by stock here. Uh, and I want us to start off with uh, some popular sectors. We'll start off with telecommunications. Uh, Chris, let's, let's, let's start with you this time around. Can you give us a few telecommunications stocks, but uh, in comparison with some Australian ones and how, how well they've done? Yeah, why don't I'll do that, Shepard. So why don't I start just by looking at the the main providers here in Australia, which are Telstra, Optus and Vodafone. Now, um, you probably realise that uh, Optus is owned by Singapore Telecommunications, which, mm -hmm. as you would expect, is listed in Singapore. Uh, Vodafone is part of the UK Vodafone group, and, of course, everyone knows Telstra. So what I might do is just flick into Scaffold. So, you know, the first thing you, you notice when looking at Telstra is that it's been a low growth business for the last um, 10 years, really. And I dare say beyond that, but we're only looking at 10 years. So the historical uh, change in value has only been 4% um, over that period of time. Dividends. Now, a lot of people talk about, you know, Telstra's an income stock and it pays great dividends. Well, mm -hmm. Dividends today are actually lower than what they were in 2006. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does have quite a good yield, but it certainly hasn't been growing those dividends at all in the last 10 years. Um, revenue only grew by 1.5% in 2016, so at least it's positive, but it's hardly screaming along. And they're forecasting low to mid single digit EBITDA growth, which I interpret as you know 2 to 5% for FY17. Um, dividends are also forecast to remain flat. So, and the other thing that we noted just in the announcement the other day about their results is that they're investing heavily into their network. They're putting another $3 billion worth into the network. They're also conducting a, a, another buyback of, of $1.5 billion worth. So that's going to increase their debt to equity ratio. Now you can see here that they're already at 87% net debt to equity. You can see that red column there shows you that they have already a lot of debt on their balance sheet. So, you know, they're, they're a highly geared business. They're a low growth business. They're ticking along, but they're certainly not shooting the lights out. So why don't we have a, a look over at uh, Vodafone okay. and just sort of see how that compares. Now, Vodafone, the first thing you notice about Vodafone, if we look at the earnings... Chris, before you go far, it's a C3. That's, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. That's right, Shepard, mm. and that really reflects what I'm about to say. Just, okay. just look at that chart there. It's up and down and all around. There's no real consistency in, in Vodafone's performance over the last few years. And if we go here to this capital history screen, you can see that in the last year they made a loss, so that's below the line, and if you look in the table below, it's a four billion pound loss that they made. Um, their projected return on equity is only 2.4%. And at the moment, they're paying out twice their twice their earnings as dividends. So hence the, the reason, Shepard, that they're, they're rated a very low C3. Now, we might also just have a quick look at um, Optus. Well, Optus, yes, yeah, Singapore Telecom. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to by way of comparison. So if I just, you might have noticed there, I clicked on the market for um, Singapore. Singapore. And if I type in Singapore, it comes up. Um, so Singapore Telecoms, uh, a bit more attractive than Vodafone. It's quite similar to Telstra in many ways. 
but perhaps not quite as attractive as Telstra, not that that's a huge benchmark to compare yourself with. But you can see here the historical change in value is 4.4 and the forecast is 6.8. So that, that's just a little bit below what Telstra was at. Return on equity, if we just go down the page a bit here, you can see return on equity is currently around 16%. That number for Telstra is around the 30% mark. And dividend yield, which, you know, often people investing in these companies, that's what they're looking for. We're looking at 4.3 for um, Singapore Telecommunications, whereas Telstra was up around 5.7. So overall, Shepard, I'd say if, you, if you're if you interested in telecoms, well, yeah. Telstra probably is actually the, the best option out of these three, but it's okay. certainly not the most inspiring of stocks. Okay. Well, look, before we move on to the next, uh, next market, I want to just ask Peter in telecommunications and probably yourself, Chris, now, we've seen this new rise in people not using the traditional mobile phone. We've, we know Optus is in this big wrangle. They've, they've grabbed the, the English Premier League. Uh, we've seen Vodafone throwing different things, Spotify. It looks like and sounds like most of these companies, uh, we know Telstra has now launched its own um, TV, sort of like a semi-station. Is this a sign that they have to evolve and move with the times and move it into more data or... Is this just trying to increase their market share in different uh, different things? I think it's the um, it's the Darwinian theory of evolution, isn't it? Okay, yeah. Uh, it's survival of the fittest, and I think that um, no one knows what the future looks like, so everyone yeah. grapples to take a bit of a stake okay. in everything that comes, every new thing that that, that, that transpires, uh, in order to reposition it. And you have you know one in five things tend to fly, and the other four tend to fail. Um, that's sort of my view of the world, now, Chris, if you've got it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, sort of following on from that theme, uh, a lot of these businesses, you know, they would like to be higher growth stocks than what they are. Mm -hmm. um, they're sort of trending towards utility businesses where yeah. they're, you know, providing data and providing um, voice services, which is basically just a very sort of steady, you know, like a utility. And they're looking for growth and they think that maybe one of these options, you know, is where growth will come from. Okay. So, yeah. All right, awesome. Well, look, um, we'll move on to the next sector. And Peter, you spoke about banks before, so I'm going to throw you a curveball and we'll try and move straight into banking. Um, just just give us a quick view of which bank I've already revealed. Uh, the biggest bank around is Commonwealth Bank. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, look, let, let's talk about banking, Commonwealth Bank versus uh, I don't know which one we, we're going to go for internationally. Yeah, I think we're, today that we're, we're looking at Royal Bank of Canada uh, okay. as a comparison. Okay. Um, now, I've been looking at the banking sector for you know for over twenty six years, twenty seven years. Yeah, I cut my teeth on these things as a young pup, right in the industry. But um, when I was first started covering banks, periods of high inflation, high growth, banks were capital hungry monsters, right? Because they did nothing, and inflation would be you know four or five percent, and every couple of years they had to raise more capital just to justify yeah. the assets they had. I think what's transpired over the last two or three decades, um, you know, moving into lower interest rate, lower um, growth environments, is that they've become less capital intensive, despite the fact that we have seen regulators over the past decade, uh, largely as a response to the GFC, actually raise capital requirements and risk ratings for certain assets. Um, from an Australian versus global perspective, yep. um, I believe our banks are a lot safer. Um, they're more retail focused than their international counterparts. They don't trade their bond books as actively and as heavily as they do offshore. They don't take major parts in foreign exchange markets. Like, uh, I think on the whole, um, our banks uh, here in Australia are, are more like giant regional banks compared to North American um, or UK European banks. So from, okay. a, from a risk perspective, I think that they're, you know, they're safer. Um, Commonwealth Bank, I was actually involved with the flow. Um, I of the CBA. Of the CBA. Wow. Um, so, you know, my job was to fly up and down from Tokyo to Southeast Asia, talking to international funds to take uh, a stake in what I called the People's Bank back then. The big opportunity back then was that the Commonwealth Bank was a, if I can, with all due respect to the bank, it was a lazy bank. It was a public service own bank, you know, we called it the Cardigan Brigade. Um, there was huge <laughs> opportunities in, in turning it into a commercially focused, um, you know, uh, business. And as with anything, I mean, you don't achieve cultural change 
and that kind of change over two or three years. You know, in the readings that I've done, it takes you at least five to ten years to really change the culture um, of an organisation. So I was in the Commonwealth Bank yesterday. Um, I, I bought a car and I, I went to get a bank check for the yeah. car. And the teller asked me, um, congratulations, you bought a car. I said, yes, I did. He said, do you, do you have insurance? And I said, well, actually, I, I've, I've, I've got all my insurance with the NRA, you know, the NRMA for the last 27 years. And um, he said, well, if, I, if you allow me to quote you for it, would you, you know, would you prepare to at least have a look at the quote? And I did. And to cut a long story short, I, worked out, I walked out of there with a, um, my car insurance for the first time in 27 years with the Commonwealth Bank. Now, you know, 20 years ago, you had to stand in line to beg for a deposit, or sorry, beg for a withdrawal kind of thing. So the place has changed, you know, a lot. But um, I've chose Royal Bank of Canada today to do the comparison because yeah. its economy is not too dissimilar to ours. We have a population base of 24 million people. They have a population base of about 35 million people. Um, we, you know, are a resources-based economy, you know, in transition. They are a resources-based you know, uh, economy. Um, so the Commonwealth Bank you know, in, in, is, is the largest listed stock um, on the ASX. Um, to be perfectly frank, I'm not quite sure where the Royal Bank of Canada sits. I don't know, Chris, if you can look it up. But uh, um, if, if we look at their ROEs, they're, they're similar. 16% um, for Royal Bank of Canada compared to 17%. For the Commonwealth Bank. Mm -hmm. If I look at the measures that um, that Scaffold uses in terms of intrinsic value, um, we can see that um, CBA has grown at a rate of just over seven percent over the last decade. Um, however, the outlook for that is slowing, and I think now sort of consensus forecasts is that we're expecting it to grow by somewhere between two and three percent over the next um, over the next three years. If we compare that with the um, the Royal Bank of Canada, yeah. um, that growth rate is um, you know, slightly higher. Um, its intrinsic value is forecast to grow at, at 4%, um, which is slightly higher than, um, than the Commonwealth Bank, mm -hmm. but it's also trading at a, you know, at a lower, at a lower P multiple. So from a big picture perspective, um, it's in a sort of a similar type of economy, similar type of population growth, similar kind of business. Yeah. And it looks to be a little bit cheaper at current levels compared to the Commonwealth Bank. Okay. Hey, Peter, look, I'll just take a question that's it's not necessarily attached to banks, but general um, investor global. And David uh, is just asking whether we should take franking credits to account when comparing yield. I think, Chris, you brought up a chat that had different yields. Uh, so, Peter, should we take franking credits, um, when, when, I mean, franking credits into account when comparing yield between Australian and foreign companies? Well, I mean, obviously, as an Australian investor, the franking does gross up the dividend yield. So my answer would be yes, because, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're looking at total income that we receive, and, and franking is a, is, a, you know, is a good proportion of that. All right, well, look, let, let's move on to the next uh, sector here. Just jump out of the scaffold. Now, I want to come back to you, Chris. Uh, it's just talking about banking, you know, I've been doing a lot of shopping online using my, my card and, uh, you know, let's talk about retail. Um, mm -hmm. Where do we stand versus uh, everyone else, you know, with yeah. the internet bringing shopping closer uh, and choices, how does that impact our Australian retail versus the global ones? Yep, okay. So, Shepard, what I'm planning to do now is I thought for retail, I'd do something a little unusual and compare West Farmers with Amazon. They hardly the same, Chris. Come on, <laughs> Amazon is an online business, and West yeah. Farmers is, is, is a brick and mortar. What yeah, are we yeah. talking about here? No, that's <laughs> right. It's probably not an obvious choice, but let me explain myself, Shepard. Okay. So West Farmers is quite a diversified business, right? This is uh -huh. a chart here of West Farmers um, revenue. Now, as you can see, Coles dominates that, but the positions two, three, and four are Home Improvements, which of course is Bunnings, yeah. Kmart, and Target. Now, if you consider those three businesses, all the stuff that they sell, you can buy that on Amazon. So when you're looking at a business like um, West Farmers, it's important to consider not just their main competitors today, but where is their competition going to come from in the future? You know, the temptation is just to compare them with other supermarkets like um, Walmart or Tesco. 
But, you know, in the last 20 years, the world has changed and it continues to do so. In actual fact, the largest listed retailer in the US is not Walmart, but it is Amazon. Amazon is now the, I think it's the fourth largest business on the US market. So with 30% of revenue for West Farmers coming from these types of businesses that may well compete with products that are sold from Amazon or other similar businesses to Amazon. You know, right now, Amazon is not, well, it, it is in Australia in that people use it, but it's not d directly targeting Australia. But they are making a huge push into India. This is the cover of Fortune magazine a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, Jeff Bezos making a big push into India. And so who's to say that they won't do something similar in Australia in mm. the not too distant future? If we just bring up this quick chart here, uh, this is just a comparison of Amazon versus West Farmers. Now you can see that Amazon is bigger than West Farmers by a factor of 10. Um, scaffold score is pretty similar. Forecast return on equity much higher for mm -hmm. Amazon. And the growth for Amazon is astronomical at 78% versus a you know, respectable um, 11% for West Farmers. That's forecast growth. And historical growth for West Farmers has actually gone down and Amazon has only just ticked along at 6%. But what you're seeing there is um, the advantage of not having all your assets tied up in a physical network of stores. Mm -hmm. you know, the, Amazon are able to capitalise on the fact that a lot, a lot of their um, infrastructure, well, it was all online, so they don't need the same sort of infrastructure as what a um, a West Farmers or a supermarket. Oops, I went to the wrong market. Sorry, I meant to go to the US. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just have a bit of a look through Amazon and then um, then take a look through West Farmers and we can compare a few things. So whilst the business economics of Amazon are attractive does that necessarily make it a good investment? If we look at West Farmers, first thing that Aussies tend to look for, as we've just discussed, is dividends. Yep. West Farmers, you know, pays quite a decent dividend, 4.5% yield. Um, looks like it's going to decline according to that forecast in 2016, but then start coming back up. Now, if we compare that to Amazon, um, you may already know the answer to this, but Amazon doesn't pay a dividend, yeah. never has, yeah. and as far as we're aware, not planning to anytime soon. Um, then there's the issue of price. So when we look at the value versus price chart, Amazon is just in a different stratosphere. Okay. <laughs> it's trading at what's at an 84% premium to its estimate of intrinsic value. Uh, if you prefer a more traditional metric like PE ratio, it's trading on a PE of 135. Um, it's got, as I said, it's got a market capitalization of 470. Well, that's US dollars, but in Aussie dollar terms, 470 billion US uh, Australian dollars. So, which makes it the fourth biggest company in the US. So, really, if it's going to justify that sort of price, it's really will have to take over the world. So on that basis, you know, whilst it's a very interesting business, it's probably not a great investment at these levels. Okay. Well, look, uh, Chris, you showed us a value versus price screen. Um, assuming everything was good, assuming Amazon looked good, now at that safety margin, what's what's the way forward? Would, would we continue looking at it or...? Um, look at I mean, it's, one, it's worth keeping on your watch list as, a, as an interesting business, but at some point... I. Personally, I couldn't invest in a business with that sort of margin because it's just, you're just betting on, you know, hope that the future is going to turn out perfectly for Amazon and mm -hmm. you know, it may well be very good, but there's there's every chance that they'll hit obstacles you don't as mean, well. You don't mean your future, you mean your children's future. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's right. <laughs> on a PE of 135, <laughs> I'd be lucky if my grandson gets to take advantage of it. <laughs> so. right. well, well, gentlemen, look, I, I, because... Uh, I'll bring in a third company that's not in scaffold, just to, to, to tap into your brains here. Now, Alibaba, because of the, the free float situation, we, we can't list it in scaffold. But where does that sit amongst um, West Farmers and Amazon? Oh, it's pretty similar to Amazon, really. It's the Chinese equivalent 
of Amazon. Mm. Um, so yeah, whilst, whilst I haven't looked at the metrics for it, I'd, I'd say it'd be very similar to what Amazon is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, look, th there's a very interesting topic, um, you know, around Australia based on property. Uh, you know, where is it going and um, how far is it? Now, Pila, if we look at the property sector, which uh, big Aussie icon can we look at and who can we compare them with? Well, I think you can't go past Westfield. Everyone knows Westfield. <laughs> big um, shops. <laughs> big shops. In fact, that's why I want to talk about Westfield today. Oh, because yeah. Everyone still thinks Westfield's a shopping centre owner. Everyone I talk to them in the street. Well, I mean, yeah. after after the restructuring with the Senate Group, the Senate Group bought all their shopping centres. So Westfield today, seventy five percent of their business is in the is in the US. Is that right? Yeah, oh, seventy five percent of the business in the US, and the other twenty five percent is um, is mainly you know in in the UK. They do have a smattering of some. Um, uh, European assets in there, uh -huh. but um, they're basically you know out of Australia. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk about uh, Westfield and I'd compare them to a company, a US company called the Simon Property Group. Okay. Um, it's also a, a notable brand for shopping centres in the states. Um, it, it's got a very large diversified portfolio, a, a mix of large uh, mall centres. And just to a lesser degree, they've got premium outlets, um, uh, outlet centres as well. Uh, it's got a market cap of close to seventy billion dollars, so it's about four or five times larger than um, than Westfield. Westfield, okay. Than Westfield, yeah. So now it's interesting that these two companies, if you look at their financial statements, like yeah, sort of with my analyst hat on. The, the financial statements look very, very different because of the differing um, accounting practices relating to how they value the shopping centres. Okay. Um, I've just put up the uh, graph here. So. Great. Yeah. Well, if you notice, Westfield um, revalues shopping centres, or here in Australia, we revalue our shopping centres yeah. and take that valuation through the P&L, um, and it raises our um, equity value. Uh, in, the, in the States, they recorded a historical cost and they depreciate it. Yeah. So I think the measure that we should be looking at um, is they call it in the States, it's widely used, uh, it's called Fund from Operation, FFO. Okay. Um, and it's generally calculated by adding depreciation and amortisation related to real estate, which is your gap in the county mm -hmm. minute yeah. term, to that income. And when you do that, it actually gives you a good comparison. So if I look at the chart that you've just put up, yep. um, Shepard, we could see that um, occupancy is about the same at 95.9%. The compound growth um, is similar at 3.7 to 3.9. Um, the yield, though, is a lot higher with Simon Group at 4.5 compared to 3.5 mm -hmm. for, for Westfield. Um, Although the price is better value for Simon okay. relative to, um, to Westfield. And more importantly, if you look at the guidance for growth on, a, on an FFO basis, we're only expecting Westfield, the market's expecting growth of just under 2% for Westfield compared to growth of um, close to 10% uh, for Simon. Um, if you look at the, um, the half-year dividend, um, and I've, I've adjusted them both for US dollars. Yeah. Um, it's $3.25, pardon me, for Simon, and 13 cents for Westfield. So if you look at the growth, what, what growth that represents on the on the prior corresponding half, yeah. you're looking at 6%, um, wow. between 6 or 7% um, dividend growth from Simon compared to very little dividend growth, if any, from Westfield. Now, it's interesting, your caller earlier asked, about um, franking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see that, that because Westfield has the majority of its earnings offshore, it doesn't pay franking either. Uh -huh. So when you're comparing an, you know, an Australian domicile stock with a large um, North American um, shopping centre stock, there's no franking, but you're getting good growth in your dividends and you're getting it at a better valuation compared to Westfield. Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Now, now, would you say these two are benefiting from the low interest rates um, that are around? Uh, to some extent, yeah, but it's not. A, I don't think it's a big play. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. Well, look, let's move on to the final sector because of time. And I want us to focus on biotechnology. Now, this is an exciting sector. So biotechnology, Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll hand this one to you. Um, uh, yeah, who would you thanks. Look at? Why don't we start with the well-known CSL? So CSL, oh. yeah, great Aussie success story, set up about 100 years ago as the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories to service the health needs of a nation which had been isolated by war. So, you know, just after World War One, they were set up to you know, look after Aussies in their, their health conditions. Uh, in 1994, they listed, and now they're the eighth largest company on the ASX, and indeed they're a global player in that whole biotech space. Um, over the last 10 years, if I go into Scaffold and pull up CSL, you can see that they have done exceptionally well over the last 10 years with an astonishing 40% growth in their uh, intrinsic value and indeed forecast to continue growing at 19%. Now, unfortunately, their, their results aren't released until tomorrow, so we have to wait until then, but, but that's going to be eagerly anticipated. So what I thought, you know, interesting just to have a little bit of a a look at how they compare on the world stage okay, since yeah. we're talking about that today. So um, this chart here, you can see right down the bottom, this is market cap in Australian dollars. CSL is actually the smallest of these. Um, They're not that big compared to Trevor. No, Rose. compared to some of these other big players like mm. Johnson & Johnson there at nearly $450 billion, um, market cap. Roche, the Swiss company, um, is 300 odd and Sanofi from Europe and GlaxoSmithKline from the UK. All these stocks you know, are available in Scaffold and you can um, look at them and compare them uh, at your leisure. But what I might do today, Shepard, is just focus in a bit on uh, Roche and see how it compares with CSL. Okay. So if we start with CSL, oops, that's not CSL, that is, you can see that it's ranked as an A3 stock, which okay. is you know very respectable. It's not quite as good. Yeah, you know, it's not one of Scaffold's preferred rankings, but it's just off. Um, but if we pull up, I'll go into Switzerland and pull up Roche, and we'll see how that compares. Uh, exactly the same. It's an A3. Okay. <laughs> right. Now, the return on equity always a key measure when you're looking at uh, any business, but particularly these, over 50% for Roche, 53%. Yep. Yep. And if I go back to CSL, we're looking at just under 50%, 49.7. So, okay. again, both very high return on equity businesses. Now, CSL's dividend yields actually quite low um, at 1.5%. And again, you know, getting back to that whole topic of franking, you can see that um, CSL's dividends are actually not franked in the okay. most recent years, and that's because a large portion of their income is now being generated overseas. So if you're comparing them with an overseas company like Roche, for example, 3.4% um, dividend yield, and of course it's not franked either, but it's yeah. a higher yield. Now, both have strong um, forecast growth which we, we touched on for CSL is around 19%, and for Roche, it's 20, 21%. Roche's intrinsic value over the last 10 years, though, pretty much flat. So, you know, we'd be looking for, they're forecasting for that to improve, but the, the track record is not as good as you would like it to be. So looking at these two businesses, you can see um, they've both been quite successful, they're both quite profitable, the thing is, though, with CSL, that success and that profitability has indeed been well and truly recognised by the market. And so it's trading at a very high valuation compared mm. to a uh, price compared to its valuation. Okay. So whilst, you know, it's probably marginally better business, Roche may well be a better investment given that it's trading at, oops, yeah, that's, sorry, that's it. Yeah. At uh, what's that? A twenty-five percent premium, still a premium, but not as much. And, and comparing that growth, which is slightly more than what CSL was. 
Investing in shares can be rewarding when you do your research, but it can also take up a lot of your time. There's so much information out there, how do you quickly sort through the companies worth investing in and those to steer clear of? Scaffold is my research tool of choice. It tracks and reports on all ASX listed companies, plus thousands of global stocks daily, helping me decide which stocks to buy and sell. I can quickly filter through the reports to get the information I need. The rating system is like a set of traffic lights for the stock market. Green is good, orange is caution and red is don't go any further. Scaffold's top stock choices have been highlighted for their outstanding performance by Money Magazine. With Scaffold doing the work for me, I have the confidence to make investment decisions without having to spend hours sifting through financial data. Now you can take control of your time and your portfolio. Why not take Scaffold for a test drive today?